Good morning. Good morning. It's wonderful to see you. How do you like my new cologne? <laughs> you like it? No, it's not really my new cologne. These flowers, I feel like I'm in the garden. Yes. Right? This is what it was like in paradise. Yes. Smelling so good. It's wonderful to see you. It's wonderful to be here. Praise God for his love, for the resurrection that validates everything we believe in. Amen? Amen. 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 Let us stand for the reading of God's word. This morning we read from Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. Behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy word. You may be seated. I don't know if you're aware. Many of you probably don't know. On April 2nd, the Yankees played the Giants and won 6-0. How many of you knew that? All right, a few. Most didn't know that. Well, it's true. The Yankees beat the Giants 6-0. That's history. It's a recorded fact, actually. Correct? Is it? <laughs> it is. It's a recorded fact. Now, what if some Giant fans disagreed and said, no, the Giants won 6-0. to zero. It's not true that the Yankees won. That's a lie. It's a myth that some Yankee fanatics made up. How would you respond and what would you say? <laughs> We've got a true Yankee fan. <laughs> well, the Martins were there. They watched the entire game. They saw the game with their own eyes. As a matter of fact, they probably have the ticket stubs. Am I correct? <laughs> Absolutely. And from what I understand, Dan actually got a picture taken behind home plate with Mariano Rivera. Is that wrong? Okay. So that's a myth. <laughs> and Mary Kay shook hands with Aaron Boone, the Yankee manager. No, that didn't happen either. But they saw the game, and they were there. They were eyewitnesses to what happened. There's video and newspaper accounts to verify the fact that the Yankees won. There's proof that goes beyond a shadow of a doubt of what actually happened. 
Amen? Well, the same holds true for the resurrection. Amen. The resurrection is a historical fact. There are some who say it's a myth. There are some who say it was made up. There are some who come up with crazy, crazy ideas to try to explain it away. Nevertheless, it is an established historical fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. As a matter of fact, Dr. Luke attests to this, and he writes in Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Dr. Luke is writing to a Roman official, Acts 1, 3, talking about Jesus. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Proofs that Christ had risen from the dead, no doubt. Speaking about an episode where Jesus comes to them in Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. So when they had come together, the disciples asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, Behold, two men stood by them with white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Proofs, testimony that this actually happened. In the mid-60s, Dr. A. N. Sherman White, an expert in Greco-Roman history from Oxford, wrote about the account in the Book of Acts. He writes, and I quote, The historical framework is exact. In terms of time and place, the details are precise and correct. As documents, these narratives belong to the same historical series as the record of the provincial and imperial trials in epigraphical and literary sources of the first and early second centuries AD. For Acts, the confirmation of histo historicity is overwhelming. Any attempt to reject its basic historicity, even in matters of detail, must now appear absurd. Roman historians have long taken it for granted. Historical fact that Christ rose from the dead. As he said he would rise from the dead before he died. Paul gives another account. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. Paul writes, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. All of these testimonies, 
all of these witnesses to the fact that Jesus Christ was alive after he died. Overwhelming testimony. Two-thirds of the gospel story, two-thirds of the gospels are devoted to the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And with meticulous care, these writers, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, wrote down for us what transpired. The women who lovingly watched the embalming of the body of the Lord Jesus by Nicodemus and Joseph, but stayed until the last trumpet blast, the beginning before the beginning of the Sabbath, and then with broken hearts, not truly knowing what would transpire, they waited. Some believe that these women actually slept outside, possibly believing what Jesus had said. The disciples didn't believe. Still, they did not believe. They were not aware, even though Jesus plainly told them what would happen. As a matter of fact, the unbelieving scribes and Pharisees listened to what Jesus said. That's why they sealed the tomb. They did not want the disciples to come and steal the body and then propose what they call a hoax that he had risen from the dead. They were aware. At the heart of the Christian gospel is the fact of the empty tomb. We believe, we believe that Jesus is alive today. Amen? Amen. Christ is alive. Well, you have in your bulletins the outline for the sermon. Number one, the miracle. The miracle. Matthew 28, 6. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. The miracle of the empty tomb. The miracle of the Savior's resurrection. The angel says, he has risen. He has risen. When Jesus cried out, it is finished on the cross, and he dismissed his spirit, he literally died. He was dead. To substantiate that, we have the witness of the Father. The witness of the Father. What happened when Christ said that? It is finished. While he is on the cross, giving up his spirit, in Jerusalem, the veil of the temple was torn in two, from the top to the bottom. The veil of the temple, put your hands together like this, the veil of the temple was this thick. That's how thick the veil was. And it was torn, torn from the top to the bottom. When Jesus declared the words, it is finished, it is finished, a testimony by God the Father that what Christ had done on the cross was complete. It was accepted. God the Father testified to that. Not only was the veil of the temple torn in two, but there was an earthquake. The rocks, the earth shook and the rocks were split. God the Father testifying to the fact that what had happened was fulfilling what God had wanted. We have the witness of the foes, John 19, 34, John 19, 34. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. His enemies decided to make sure, to make certain that Christ was dead. Do you recall the story? The soldiers went to Calvary, they were there, and they came up to the first thief, and they saw that the first thief was still alive. You, you understand that the crucifixion can linger on for days. Those who were crucified on the cross would be there for days as they slowly, in a torturous, horrific death, expired. And so what did the soldier do when he came to the first thief? Seeing that he was alive. You remember? He broke his legs. 
He broke the legs of the thief on the cross to do what? To expedite his death. And they did the same thing to the second thief. They broke his legs so that he would die quickly. What did they do when they came to Jesus? They knew he was already dead. And so they took a spear and they shoved it up his side into his heart. And water and blood flowed from his heart, from that spear wound. To certify the fact that Jesus Christ was dead. The witness of the foes, the witness of his friends, Matthew 27, 59. Matthew 27, 59. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud. Let me ask you a question. If Jesus was still alive, would he have taken him down and wrapped his body in a shroud? Absolutely not. There are those who try to create a myth that Jesus just fainted on the cross. And that when he was put in the tomb, the coldness of the tomb revived him and he came back to life. Always looking to try to get around the truth and the fact of the matter. Joseph took his body wrapped in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And they rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. From that moment after he had given up his spirit, none but loving hands touched his body as they brought him down off the cross and laid him in the tomb. And they embalmed him in the manner of the Jews. A great stone was rolled across the, the door of the tomb, and it was sealed at the request of the chief priests. These stones that were used to seal up a tomb or a sepulcher were around 440 pounds. That was their weight. And they were put in such a position as to be able to roll down in front of the tomb to seal the tomb. So this great stone is rolled in front of the tomb. Not only was it rolled in front of the tomb, there was a seal that was put on the stone. Now what did that entail? Well, it was a string that went across the, the stone itself, and then with two packets of clay, it, would help, it was held to the stones on either side. And then the Romans would take their rings and they would put their rings as a signet on that clay. Anyone, anyone moving that stone sealed this way was guilty of death. They would be dead, they would be crucified. Not only that, there were guards put in place. Now a lot of times we see maybe one or two guards that were put in place to guard the tomb. It wasn't one or two guards. It was a unit of guards. These were 16 men, 16 heavily trained men to protect an area of 36 square feet. That was what they trained for. That's what they were responsible for. And if they failed in their duties, all 16 would be burned alive. That was the judgment for failing to do their to do their job, to do their duty. Sixteen men were there protecting to make certain that the stone was not rolled away. Matthew 27, 66 says, So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting the guard. How preposterous is that? How ridiculous. Sealing the tomb and putting a guard. Not knowing the power of God. Not understanding who God is. These men sought to secure the body of the living Christ in a tomb and make certain that it wouldn't rise from the dead. How preposterous. How ludicrous. Jesus said he would rise from the dead and what did he do? He rose from the dead. No man, no seal, no unit of guards could restrain him. Matthew 
Matthew 28, 5 through 6. But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who is crucified. He's not here. He's risen as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Jesus says in Revelation chapter 1, 18, I am the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and hell. Jesus Christ is alive today, seated at the right hand of God the Father. Testimony, testimony, eyewitnesses. The Jewish historian, the Jewish historian, Flavius Josephus. You're familiar with him, right, brother? Flavius Josephus. He was a Jewish historian. He's not a Christian. He writes these words. Actually, in addition, he was not a contemporary of Jesus, but a little bit after Christ. He writes, quote, Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure, he drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. Here's a Jew stating that he was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive and again the third day. This is history written by a historian. As the divine prophets had foretold these and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians, so named from him, are not extinct at this day. Josephus writes a historical account. The miracle of the Savior's liberation. Again, the angel says he's not here, he is risen. In his book, The Study of the Risen Master, Henry Latham writes these words, quote, Our Lord passed through grave clothes and left them entirely untouched. What happened behind that stone, in that tomb? Jesus' body wrapped in linen. His body disappeared. And the clothes that he was wrapped in simply dropped down. The napkin for his face was in a separate place, unruffled. This is what impressed John and brought him to a personal belief in the resurrection. You remember how he looked in and saw the napkin and the grave clothes lying undisturbed? He looked and he believed. That's what brought John to that saving knowledge that truly this is the Christ, this is the Messiah, this is the Savior. And he believed. The miracle of the empty tomb is the foundation of Christian doctrine. And this is the evidence that the world needs, that is in a desperate need of salvation and transformation. The world needs to hear that Jesus is alive today. The world today is dark, and there are many, many, many who are lost. Many, many who are desperate. Many, many who are searching. They need to hear of this resurrected Christ that died for them. And that's what will transform our world. John writes in 1 John 1, 1 through 3. That which was from the beginning, that referring to Jesus, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. They were there, they heard everything. That which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, they saw. Which we looked upon and have touched, and have touched with our own hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, 
and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you eternal life which was with the Father and was man manifest to us that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you why why is it proclaimed why is this so important why is this good news ladies and gentlemen because it saves us from our sins when you trust in Christ when you place your faith in what he did on the cross your sins are forgiven you are cleansed not only that we have new life amen, amen. we are a new creation a new creature in Christ he becomes a reality to you and to me in our hearts and in our lives we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ the Apostle John testifies what he heard what he saw what he touched all a reality and then he gives us an account in John 20 verse 27 here they were together and Jesus appears to them and then Jesus says to Thomas put your finger here put your finger here see my hands put out your hand put your hand into my side Thomas put your hand into my side I want you to feel I want you to see I want you to put your finger here I want you to understand that I am alive do not disbelieve Jesus says to Thomas but believe is this a myth is this a lie Luke chapter 24 36 through 40 as they were talking about these things Jesus himself stood among them and said to them peace be with you but they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit and he said to them why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts see my hands and my feet that it is myself touch me Jesus says touch me and see a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have and when he had said this he showed them his hands and his feet he made himself known and he said touch me touch me the message the message is clear the Christ of Calvary was crucified he was crucified because it was necessary why was it necessary Isaiah makes it clear to us in Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 Isaiah 59 1 through 2 behold the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save neither is his ear so dull that it cannot hear but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear it's necessary for us to have forgiveness and the remission of sins because otherwise God does not see or hear we are separated from God why because we are sinful creatures we're sinful creatures and God has made a provision so that we might have that wall separated so that the veil in our hearts would be torn from the top to the bottom and light can shine through that veil and his Holy Spirit comes through and now the holies of holies is open to you and to me and we can commune with a holy God not because we're good, not because we're perfect, not because we've done this or done that, 
simply based on the fact that Christ has paid for our sins. We have the remission of sins, which gives you and me peace. Peace with God and the peace of God. Christ of victory. He is not here, he's risen. It's a word of salvation. Every foe has been completely defeated. Sins have been paid for. Satan has been defeated. Death has been defeated. Every one of us here will die. Would you agree with that? Every one of us here will die. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. There is a day coming when each one of us will die. We cannot avert death other than the fact that if Christ comes now, we will be raptured. Amen? Amen. Which is a wonderful thing. I'm not looking forward to dying, but nevertheless, we will all die. And yet, the punishment for our sins has been taken care of, and we will only pass through that curtain quickly to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's victory for you and for me. Victory. The sovereignty of Christ, Matthew 28, 7. Then go quickly, he says, and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, the angel said. Behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. The word of commission. What did Jesus tell his disciples in Galilee? What did he tell his disciples in Galilee? Anybody remember? All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. It's right on your bulletin, it's in the back page. Therefore go, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Ladies and gentlemen, people need the Lord Jesus. I need the Lord Jesus. You need the Lord Jesus. Those that have not known him or, or experienced him, they need the Lord Jesus. Every soul, every person who is not been forgiven of their sins, will one day have to stand before Almighty God. And that wall of separation that I read to you in Isaiah 59, 1 through 2, that wall of separation will mean separation from God forever. So, the good news, God calls us to go, to go and tell, to go and tell everyone about Jesus. He is the Savior of the world, and He continues to save today. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we are so, so glad and so happy today that we are assured, we are certain of the resurrection. Lord Jesus, you are alive, you live within us, you live in heaven, and everywhere where your children are walking. You hold us, you uphold us, you, you save us, you guard us, you meet every one of our needs. You are so faithful and loving and kind. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be witnesses, to go and tell the world that you are alive, that you exist today based on historic evidence and testimony that's given by those who saw you, who heard you, who touched you. Father, use us in a miracle way to touch others that they might also come to this saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We ask it, Father, for his sake. Amen. Amen. Let us stand and sing our closing hymn. Number 368, he lives. 368, he lives.
your heart. Amen? Amen. Amen. He's alive. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for this new life that you have given to us. Use us now for your honor and glory as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name we ask it. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.